Good morning. Please turn to Colossians chapter 3. We'll get there in a, in a little while. This morning we are, we are continuing on our series in Colossians, but before we get to that passage, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking specifically about the resurrection. And you'll see that the resurrection does relate to our passage today as well, although it's obviously not a traditional uh, resurrection passage. Some years we spend uh, time leading up to Easter and preaching on Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday on those themes, and some years we continue with our current series as we're doing this year. But uh, let's pray, then we'll talk about the resurrection, and then we'll get into Colossians 3 as well. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are, our great and risen Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and for rising again. Lord Jesus, it is a privilege to know you, and it's a privilege to have your word and to study it this morning. Lord, we thank you for Resurrection Sunday. We thank you for every Sunday that really is Resurrection Sunday in a way as we gather on the first day of the week because you were raised on the first day of the week. And we thank you for this Easter Resurrection Sunday in particular. Open our hearts as we look into your word, we pray. Amen. You can read about Jesus' resurrection from the dead in Matthew 28, in Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. And sometimes if you read them all together, people get a little bit confused about the chronology of Jesus' resurrection appearances, since each gospel highlights a, a different part and emphasizes a different part. But all four do go together. All four accounts do go together. They fit together, and they talk about several people and groups of people that Jesus appeared to after rising from the dead. And then there's also the famous 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, resurrection chapter that talks about Jesus' post-resurrection appearances prior to returning to heaven. And in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 14 and verse 17, we have, have those well-known verses that tell us what we would already probably know as well, but it tells us really clearly, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our faith is futile and our faith is vain because Jesus Christ's physical, historical resurrection is an integral part of the gospel message. I remember going through a phase a while back where I would look up on YouTube the debates between Christians and atheists about the resurrection. And I was constantly impressed with how the, the Christians would win the debates because the case for Jesus' resurrection is a strong, logical case that makes a lot of sense. In fact, Richard Swinburg, Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at the University of Oxford, wrote a book in 2003 called The Resurrection of God Incarnate. And he says that based on the available evidence that we have today and on probability theory that there's a 97% chance that Jesus truly miraculously rose from the dead. And he would go around speaking and debating and defending that to all kinds of people all over the world. And you can go online, you can watch hours and hours of talks on Jesus' resurrection, you can read whole books on the subject and see how it's, it's very reasonable to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I'd like to share just five brief reasons why you should believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They come from Lee Strobel and they're memorable since they all start with the letter E. And you can look up Lee Strobel or uh, Mike Klykona or Gary Habermas. These guys have written books on this subject and they're fantastic books that I recommend you to you. Here are Lee Strobel's five E's for the Easter resurrection. Reasons why we should believe in the resurrection. Number one, Jesus was executed. We can be sure that Jesus was dead. The Romans were very, very good experts at killing people, so don't imagine for a moment that Jesus survived and then uh, revived in the tomb. He actually was executed. He actually died, and in fact, even non-Christian historians like Tacitus and Josephus confirm that Jesus really did die. He was executed, number one. E number two is there were early accounts of Jesus' resurrection. Not only do we have the four Gospels, but 1 Corinthians 15 gives a creed stating that Jesus died for our sins and was resurrected on the third day. And the creed has been dated by scholars, even skeptical scholars, even, even atheist scholars have to admit that this creed has to be dated to just a few years after Jesus' death. Very early accounts of the resurrection. There was no time for, for legends to grow up. We're not reading stuff that was written a couple hundred years later and 
as legend, we're reading stuff that was early accounts, which leads us into number 3E, which is that the tomb was found empty, is the 30 empty. Nobody in the first century was claiming that it was anything but empty. Everybody knew that the tomb was empty. The authorities said that the disciples stole the body, but the disciples had no motive or ability or opportunity to do so. And the fact that they had to make up that story simply confirms that the tomb was empty. The skeptics had to invent a story to explain why the tomb was empty because they couldn't produce the body because the body wasn't there because he was raised. The tomb was empty. And number four, going along with early accounts, number four E is eyewitness evidence. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul mentions individuals who saw the risen Jesus and he mentions some by name. He makes it clear that there were 500 others and he says that some are still alive and so you could go check it out and talk to them yourself to confirm that there was eyewitnesses who saw Jesus rise from the dead. And then the fifth E is the emergence of the early church. The Christian church emerged in the very city where Jesus was crucified. How do you explain the sudden uh, rising of the Christian church and the explosion of the Christian church apart from the resurrection? If Jesus just died and stayed dead, the movement should have fizzled out, but instead it exploded a few days later, a short time later. And think of the disciples changed lives in that same vein. They went from being cowards to being courageous preachers, even martyrs for their faith and their belief in the resurrection. They wouldn't have died for their faith in the resurrection if they had not seen the risen Christ and therefore knew that the resurrection was true. And the early church would not have emerged so rapidly just after Jesus died if Jesus had not also resurrected. So there's five E's that are kind of memorable. You should know these kind of things. And if you're a parent, you should share these kind of things with your kids. I know a lot of the kids around here are aged, you know, five, six, seven. And at this point, they kind of believe everything that their parents tell them and don't question it. But eventually, they're going to grow up a little bit. And when they're 10, 11, and 12, you're going to want to be able to explain why it's reasonable to believe in the resurrection. They're going to have questions. You should have answers. And so remember these kind of things for the sake of your kids as well, if you're a parent. You could go on with lots of more lines of evidence. There's a bulletin insert with similar kind of stuff and some other things in it as well. At the end of the day, the evidence is great, and I like it, and it confirms and strengthens our faith. But also, at the end of the day, we remember that that we believe in Jesus' death and resurrection ultimately by faith because the Holy Spirit has opened our hearts and, and given us the gift of faith. And we believe the Bible, and we believe in the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, at this point, I'd like to ask you to stand for our scripture reading of Colossians 3, verses 1 to 17. Please stand with me for the reading. Colossians 3. I'm going to read 1 to 17. I preached on 1 to 4 last week, and we'll have to remember that. And then we'll look at verses 5 to 17 this week. Colossians 3, starting at verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these two you once walked when you were living in them, but you now must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator." Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, patience, meekness, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Please be seated. I remember as a kid, it was always exciting when our class went down to the gym with a bunch of other classes for some special event. We knew something special was happening. We didn't really usually know what was happening, but we knew that it would be better than math class or whatever we normally did at that time, although I did enjoy math class as a kid too, oddly enough. But sometimes it was a school assembly of some point, of some kind. Sometimes it was a motivational speaker. And one time as a kid, I remember we all went down to the gym and for some reason we got together to watch a movie called The Karate Kid. I don't know if the teachers were just tired of teaching or if us kids were driving them crazy or maybe it was a, a scheduled uh, day in the schedule. But we watched The Karate Kid and I don't honestly remember all that much about it. I think it had something to do with fighting, which I think I could tell from the title. The one part that I kind of remember though is that the kid was, was going around doing all these, he thought he was doing like all these household chores, right, for the teacher, and, and then he found out later on that actually what he was doing had a purpose in, uh, in defending, I guess, for karate. And there's that, that, famous, uh, that fa famous wax on, wax off scene. He was wax on and wax on and wax off. And I don't know if it's a real karate move or not, but it, I, I remember seeing the movie, don't remember much of it, but I remember that memorable scene. Now think with me for a moment. If, if all the Karate Kid did was wax off and wax off and wax off, but he never waxed on, what good would that have been? It, it wouldn't have been very good, right? Half of his body would have been open for attack and, and he would have, uh, would have lost his fight. He would only be doing half the move. It would be useful. He needed to, useless. He needed to do both things, wax off and wax on, complete the whole thing. Now the Bible doesn't talk very much about waxing off and waxing on, but what the Bible does talk about is putting off and putting on. The Bible talks about it a bit in today's passage, and the putting off is what we as Christians should stop doing, and the putting on is what we as Christians should start doing instead. And it's very important to realize that both in today's passage and in other places in the Bible that tell us to put off one thing and to put on the opposite thing, that these are things that we, we should be doing as Christians, not things that we should be doing to become Christians. Becoming a Christian does not have to do with putting off bad behavior and putting on good behavior. Becoming a Christian doesn't have to do with becoming a gooder person. Now, I know gooder is not really a word, but if you could become gooder than the goodest, next goodest person, it still would not make you a Christian. You cannot earn salvation by putting off bad behavior and putting on good behavior. Salvation cannot be earned. Salvation is a free gift of God that must be received by faith. Eternal life comes when we repent of our sins and believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and that he rose again. Salvation doesn't come from putting off bad behavior and putting on good behavior, trying to become a better person. But once you're a Christian, once you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, naturally, you desire to obey Him, and you want to grow to be more like Christ, and that's where a chapter like Colossians chapter 3 comes in, telling us what not to do, and then telling us what to do instead. Sometimes in the Bible, the thing that we should put off or put to death or stop doing is contrasted right in the next verse with something that we should put on and, and start doing. And we see that a bit in today's passage. But many times the, the put off and the put on coupling aren't right in the same verse and you kind of need to compare and contrast different Bible verses from different places. And if you do that, you could actually come up with a list of 78 different pairs of things that the Bible says to put off one bad thing and put on the opposite and put on the good thing. And I'll email out that list of 78 different pairs to you this afternoon, so give me your email address if I don't have it already. But today's passage starts off in verse 5 saying to put off sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. That's verse 5. Then we get to verse 6, which actually says, on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. 
Now, I just, just kind of as an aside, but as it comes up, the phrase, the wrath of God, I do want to point out to you that if, if you're tempted to become one of those kind of uh, like new kind of Christians, kind of, kind of progressive and trying to make the Bible more like culturally uh, acceptable, then, then you, have, you come to a verse like this and you've got to try to cross this verse out of your Bible because once again, this verse in the Bible talks about the wrath of God. There's at least 15 verses that specifically say the wrath of God or say God's wrath in them and lots of paragraphs that describe it. And I would just encourage you, continue to submit to how God describes himself in the Bible. Don't try to make God in your own image and scratch out all these verses that say wrath. It's there in this passage on account of sin, the wrath of God is getting poured out. Of course, we, we know that God is love, right? God is absolutely love. God is also just, though, and the two things are not opposed to each other. The two things actually go together in God's working and dealing with humanity. And this is most clearly seen in the gospel of Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ died to atone for our sins. God's justice requires that there be a payment for the penalty of sin. God's love desires to forgive and to restore fellowship. And so God's love and justice are both maintained when Jesus lovingly dies to pay the penalty for our sin. So verse 5 lists some vices, then verse 8 also lists five more. Anger, wrath. God's wrath is holy and righteous, but our wrath is not, so we need to, to put away our kind of wrath. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk. And then if you skip down for a few minutes to verse 12, you see things that we should put on. It says compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. And the patience includes bearing with one another and forgiving each other and especially over all these things putting on love, verse 14 says. So first think of what you should put off, but then don't remain there with nothing on. Think about what you should put on as the right behavior. Think of Lazarus for a moment in John chapter 11 when, he, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. He's all wrapped up in linen strips and cloths. And so after he was raised, he took off those linen strips and those cloths. But do you think he just took the grave clothes off and then walked around without anything? No, obviously he took off the grave clothes and then he put on the proper clothes for living. And that's what we must do as Christians. If you're a Christian, you've, you've gone from being dead spiritually to being alive spiritually. So take off those old clothes and put on the proper clothes for living the Christian life. And this has a couple of benefits in our lives as well. One is that as Christians, for our witness, we can be known not just, we shouldn't just be known for what we're against and what we don't do. We should be known for what we're for and all the wonderful, Christ-like, loving, good behavior that we do as Christians. And also this idea of putting off, but not just putting off, but also putting on the right behavior helps you to make real change in the Christian life. Because sometimes Christians try to change by, by solely just breaking bad habits, but the change is not going to last unless you replace the bad thing with a good habit. Replace the bad habit with a good habit. Don't just put off anger, but follow that up by putting on patience. Don't just try to put off obscene talk, but follow that up by putting on kindness. It goes together. Putting off and putting on. It goes together in this passage, in Ephesians, and in many other places in God's Word. Now the big question that we'll spend some time on is, how do we do this? How do we put off the bad stuff and then put on the good stuff? We know it doesn't just happen naturally. It doesn't just happen by trying harder. Sometimes we try and fail. How do we actually do this? And I think the answer is found right here in this chapter in verse, I think there's three answers. Verse 1 is an answer, verse 9 and 10, and verse 16. So first answer from last week in verse 1, to make progress in the Christian life, we have to understand, and you heard this if you were here last week, we have to understand that we have been raised with Christ. As verse 1 says, today is Resurrection Sunday and we're celebrating in a special way what we celebrate every single Sunday when we meet on the first day of the week and that is that Jesus has been raised, not just figuratively or, or not just spiritually risen in our hearts, but literally physically risen from the dead. And his death and resurrection, in the words of the famous hymn, breaks the power of canceled sin. Because when we trust in, in Christ, we die to sin and we are raised to 
with Christ. And the reason that there is hope to put to death sexual sin and covetousness and anger and obscene talk and these other things in this chapter and elsewhere, the reason there's hope to do that is because you've died and you've been raised with Christ and your life is now hidden with Christ in God, as Colossians 3 verse 3 says. We realize this is not a traditional Easter Sunday sermon this morning or an Easter Sunday passage, but this passage certainly relates to the resurrection because it's because of Christ's resurrection and then our resurrection and being raised with him that there is hope to do what this passage is telling us to do. Second answer comes from verses 9 and 10, which says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Now notice that this particular verse doesn't say, you need to try to put off the old self, and then you need to try to put on the new self. This isn't actually saying you need to try to do that. It's saying you've already done that. If you're a Christian, you've already done that. It says, do not lie to one another. Why not? Because you have already put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. On the one hand, we need to put off bad behavior and put on good behavior on a daily basis. Every day we need to do that. But on the other hand, the reason why we can do that is because as Christians, as believers in Christ, we have once and for all put off the old self and put on the new self. The old nature has passed away. The old has passed away. The new has come. We're a new creation in Christ. We've put off the old self. So then when we read a passage today about putting off certain sinful behavior, it's like it's telling us, don't revert back to that. You don't have to because you have put off the old self. You can walk in newness of life. Don't revert back to your old ways. Romans 6 verse 6 similarly says, Our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that you would no longer be enslaved to sin. And then Romans 6.11 says, So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Consider the fact that you're dead to sin. Consider the fact that you have put off the old self with its practices. And then in a moment of temptation, don't revert back to old ways, but walk in active obedience, actively put sin to death, put off the bad, put on the good. You don't have to sin because you have put off the old self, the old nature, and you are a new creation in Christ if you have put saving faith in Christ. Of course, this new self, this new creation, does need constant renewing and refreshing. And so verse 10 in that same passage, that same verse goes on to say, you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Similarly, Ephesians 4 verse 23 talks about uh, being renewed in our minds. And Romans 12 verse 2 famously says to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The more you renew your mind on God's word and the truth that you have put off your old self and that you are a new creation in Christ, and the more you you renew your mind through a close, personal walk with Jesus Christ, the more you will become like Christ and the more you'll put to death and put off bad behavior day in and day out and, and put on the good character and good behavior that our passage is calling for day in and day out. Which leads us to the third part of the answer, the third answer for how to put off the bad and how to put on the good, which is found in verse 16 of our passage. If you look down at verse 16, what does it say? It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The more intimately acquainted you are with the word of God, the word of Christ written down in the Bible, the more successfully you will live out your new nature and put off the bad and put on the good. Read God's word. Study God's word. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Apply it. Apply it. 
The closer you are to Jesus to reading his word, the further you will be from sin. D.L. Moody famously said, the Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. Have you ever been caught up in a, a rut of sin? Have sins from this passage, like sexual immorality, or covetousness, or obscene talk, or lying, or sins from other passages, have they become commonplace in your life, rather than the good things from this passage, like compassion, kindness, humility, love? If so, get back into the Bible. Get into the Bible every Sunday. Get into the Bible in a small group. Read the Bible with a friend, with someone else. Read the Bible on your own. Dwell in the Bible. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you, it says. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Richly, richly. Not just a, a little bit. Not just an average Canadian amount. Not just what you would get on Sundays from coming to church each Sunday. But richly, day in and day out, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Dive into the Bible and dwell and live in the Bible. This verse even says that we should sing songs about the Bible, based on the Bible, which we try to do around here and which you should do at home and in the car as well. This passage mentions psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms can possibly mean uh, singing the Old Testament book of Psalms. But when Colossians was written, there was no distinction between old or historic hymns compared to modern worship songs the way there is today. So don't mistakenly think that this passage is saying hymns meaning Charles Wesley and spiritual songs meaning Chris Tomlin. There wasn't, wasn't a distinction like that when this is written. These are just supposed to be synonyms saying, sing everything, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, sing it all, but, but have these songs based on the Bible so that as you're singing, when you're singing together, you're admonishing and teaching one another, you're teaching yourself. Have these songs based on the Bible so that when you're singing, the Word of Christ is dwelling in you richly, even as you sing. Here on Sunday mornings, the goal is not just that the Word of Christ dwells in us richly during the sermon time, though we certainly want that, but we want the Word of Christ to dwell in us richly during the, the singing time as well, and it does because our songs are based on the Bible and are full of the, the gospel and full of the truth of God's Word. So we basically know what we're supposed to do when we read a passage like this. You can tell anybody, you don't have to be a scholar, you can read this passage, you can understand, okay, there's certain behavior that we're supposed to, as Christians, put to death, put off that behavior, and then there's certain behavior that we should put on. We should, we should live and walk in newness of life and put on that certain behavior. We all know what we're supposed to do, but it's easier said than done, right? But it is possible Number one, it's possible because verse one says you have been raised with Christ. Again, this is not an Easter sermon or an Easter resurrection passage, but actually it is an Easter resurrection passage because this passage relates to the resurrection and our Christian life relates to the resurrection every day. Since Christ is risen and we've risen with him, this passage is possible. Number two, it's possible because verses 9 and 10 say, you have put off the old self and you have put on the new self, so you just got to live like you already are. You've, you've already done this, now do it day in and day out. Walk as a new person in Christ. And number three, it's possible when you have a close walk with God by letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. All things are possible through Christ. Without Christ, we can do nothing, as John 15, 5 says. But through Christ, all things are possible, Philippians 4, 13 says. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, including putting off sinful behavior and putting on behavior that pleases God. And verse 17 of our passage says, the ultimate thing that we should put on then to cap it all off in verse 17, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If you're ever not sure whether or not you should do something, and you start to kind of justify it in your mind, and you know that, it's, that maybe it's sinful, but you say, well, maybe it's not sinful, maybe it's okay. Ask yourself, can I do this in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father? And if you can, then go ahead and do it. But if you can't do that, giving thanks to God the Father and in the name of Christ, then put it off and put it to death. 
If you were here a couple of weeks ago, you would remember that at the end of chapter 2, we got the idea that the Colossians had been taught or had started to believe perhaps that, that the key to living a better life, putting off bad behavior, putting on good behavior, the key they thought maybe was asceticism. But Paul said in Colossians 2 verse uh, 23, These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the the body, but they have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. The only thing that has value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh is being a new creation in Christ and then recognizing that you've been raised with Christ. You have put off the old self. You have put on the new self. You are a new person in Christ. So today's passage, like every passage in Colossians, once again, it comes back to Jesus Christ. Remember, the Colossians thought that they needed something else besides Christ added into their Christianity in order to find uh, fulfillment or fullness in their Christian life. And again and again, we're reading in these passages that Christ is everything and you don't need to add anything else. You don't need to look beyond Christ for fullness or satisfaction or holiness or progress in the Christian life. You need to look more deeply into Christ. So look to Jesus this Easter Sunday and look to Jesus every day of your life. Look to Jesus, our crucified and risen Savior. In conclusion... Let me read you a page from John Calvin from his institutes that I came across from Kevin DeYoung on the Gospel Coalition website earlier this month. It relates to Easter, and it relates to Colossians, since a major theme of Colossians is how fullness and life and progress and everything is found in Jesus Christ. And this is a beautiful picture from Calvin about how everything is found in Jesus Christ. He says, we see that the whole, our whole salvation and all its parts are comprehended in Christ. We should therefore take care not to derive the least portion of it from anywhere else. If we seek salvation, we are taught by the very name of Jesus that it is of him. If we seek any other gifts of the Spirit, they will be found in his anointing. If we seek strength, it lies in his dominion. If purity in his conception. If gentleness, it appears in his birth, for by his birth he was made like us in all respects, that he might learn to feel our pain. If we seek redemption, it lies in his passion. If acquittal, in his condemnation. If remission of the curse, in his cross. If satisfaction, in his sacrifice. If purification, in his blood. If reconciliation, in his descent. If mortification of the flesh, in his tomb. If newness of life, in his resurrection. If immortality, in the same. If inheritance of the heavenly kingdom, in his entrance into heaven. If protection, if security, if abundant supply of all blessings, in his kingdom. If untroubled expectation of judgment in the power given him to judge. In short, since rich store of every kind of goods is found in him, let us drink our fill from this fountain and from no other. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, once more we thank you for your resurrection. We thank you for your resurrection power living in us and that we have been raised that we have been forgiven and that we have put our faith in Christ, we have put off our old self, the old nature, and put on the new nature, that we're a new creation in you. Help us, Lord, to become what we are and to walk in what we are, day in and day out, putting off the bad, putting on the good. For your glory and for our good, for our growth in Christ's likeness, we pray. Let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, Lord. Help us to, to let your word dwell in us richly day in and day out. Keep us in the Bible. Keep us ever in your word and help us to continually make progress in our Christian walk and in our sanctification. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll call up Brian for a closing song.